In this video, we're going to look at autoimmune diseases and allergies. So in the previous video, we looked at the adaptive immune response, which involves the B cells and the T cells, and how they have very specific receptors that bind to a very specific antigen. And that all works great when it's attacking a pathogen, but sometimes those specific B cells and T cells will attack our own tissues, causing an autoimmune disease, or will attack something harmless and cause an allergy. Our B cells and T cells go through a maturation process or a negative selection process in the bone marrow for B cells and in the thymus for the T cells. And this is where our body should eliminate the cells that have receptors that will recognize our self antigens. So these B cells and T cells are eliminated through this process, but it's not perfect. So how those B cells and T cells are eliminated is related to how strongly those receptors will bind to an antigen. And very strong interactions tell the cell that it is a self protein and they will go through apoptosis and die. But there's always going to be some B cells and T cells that will react to a self antigen and they won't go through this apoptosis process. And then they will eventually migrate to the spleen or the lymph nodes and they could potentially cause an autoimmune disease. But having autoreactive lymphocytes does not mean that you will for sure have an autoimmune disease. So there are genetic components and there are environmental components, but really we don't know what specifically causes these B cells and T cells to start overreacting. So some autoimmune diseases will be primarily T cell mediated using cytotoxic T cells and some types of autoimmune diseases will be more antibody mediated and allergies, for example, are also antibody or B cell mediated. But the underlying mechanism is generally the same for all of the different types of autoimmune diseases. The only difference is what tissue or what antigen they're targeting. So for example, with multiple sclerosis, the immune cells are going to be attacking the myelin sheath, which is produced by oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. And then eventually it will start to affect sensory and motor function. Whereas type one diabetes, this is an autoimmune disease where the immune cells attack the beta islet cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. With celiac disease, the immune cells start to attack the epithelial lining of the small intestine, and there's a cross reactivity with gluten. So people with celiac disease can't eat gluten because the immune cells will recognize both of those. With Addison's disease, this is when the immune system attacks the adrenal cortex. So the adrenal cortex produces three major categories of hormones, cortisol, DHEA, and aldosterone. So symptoms of Addison's disease are going to be related to those hormones. Whereas aplastic anemia, this is affecting the bone marrow. So the bone marrow is where we produce our red blood cells and our white blood cells. So in the red bone marrow. So if our immune system attacks the bone marrow, then we can't make enough blood cells. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, they are inflammatory bowel diseases. Crohn's disease can be impacted anywhere along the whole digestive tract, whereas ulcerative colitis tends to stick to the large intestine. The thyroid is commonly impacted by autoimmune diseases. With Graves' disease, the immune system produces antibodies that stimulate the thyroid cells to increase the production of thyroid hormones, and it causes a goiter and a hyperthyroidism. With Hashimoto's, then the immune system is attacking the thyroid cells and generally causing a hypothyroidism. Lupus is another example. Um, this is when the immune system attacks nuclear antibodies, so it can attack many tissues. It can commonly cause a butterfly shaped rash. It can also affect the joints and the kidneys and the skin. It has many, many different symptoms. With myasthenia gravis, this affects the muscles. It's actually affecting the acetylcholine receptor. So motor neurons release acetylcholine to make the muscles contract. The receptors that bind that acetylcholine, those are attacked by the immune system. And then rheumatoid arthritis, it affects the joints. 
and psoriasis, the immune system is, a, is targeting the skin cells and the inflammation causes an increase in the replication of the skin cells and they start to get very thick and dry and hard. So different autoimmune diseases have the same underlying kind of mechanism where we have autoreactive lymphocytes, but the difference is in which tissue is going to be targeted. There are over a hundred different autoimmune diseases and they impact over 300 million people in the world. Nobody knows what exactly causes them and nobody can cure any of them. And this is actually an increasing problem. So in the last few decades, the incidence and prevalence of autoimmune diseases has been increasing pretty dramatically. And also interesting that it's happening primarily in industrialized countries like North America, Europe, and Australia. So if you have a look at this graph here, we have a few examples, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's, asthma, celiac, and the thyroid ones. And we can see from, you know, about the 1950s to recently, there's been a continuing increase in autoimmune diseases. And if we have a quick look at the distribution of some, so this is multiple sclerosis, and you can see the regions industrialized countries tend to have more multiple sclerosis, same kind of distribution for psoriasis. There seems to be a kind of consistent geographical distribution. So then that leads us to why are these happening and why are they increasing in industrial countries? We don't know. So we just know that there are multiple environmental factors that could have a significant impact. One of the most predominant theories is called the hygiene theory. And this relates to our exposure to infectious organisms as well as to soil bacteria, harmless environmental microorganisms, as well as symbiotic or probiotic microorganisms that live in our digestive system and on our skin. When we have a lack of exposure to good microorganisms, then that has an impact on how our immune system functions. So in other videos, we talked about how our large intestine has microflora. These microflora, there's about at least a thousand, probably 300 predominant species of bacteria that live primarily in our large intestine. And they help to regulate our immune response. So they also help our immune system learn to tolerate certain things like food molecules. And these symbiotic bacteria start to develop from birth and up until about the age of three, our immune system is undergoing a lot of development where it learns to recognize pathogens, ourself, harmless things, food, microflora. And so those first few years of childhood, having exposure to good bacteria is actually extremely beneficial. And it's been shown that kids that grow up on farms or have lots of pets or very large families tend to have less autoimmune diseases, allergies, and asthma. And if you look at the distribution in the world, countries that have more infections tend to have less autoimmune diseases. So there is some connection with exposure to microorganisms and our immune response. There is also potentially genetic susceptibility. There have been studies that have shown the MHC molecule, the major histocompatibility complex, um, that is unique to everyone and it is what carries the antigen to the lymphocytes. Um, there have been some connections with some mutations in those MHC molecules. So there may be a genetic component. Another major mechanism is called molecular mimicry. And this is when the immune system will react with one substance and it will be similar enough to something else that the immune cell can then, once proliferation has occurred and the immune system is attacking that pathogen, then it may start to also attack that similar antigen. And we call that molecular mimicry. So this can happen sometimes if people are exposed to a certain kind of a pathogen, like for example, mononucleosis. And then if there's antigens that are similar enough to self antigens, then sometimes people can be more predisposed to something like lupus or multiple sclerosis. So molecular mimicry means that generally some kind of an infectious organism or some kind of a food molecule even that is similar enough or that the immune system reacts to, it will then start to also react to our self cells that are similar. 
Next, when we look at the geographical distribution, we can see that climate may be playing a very significant role. So countries that have more sunlight produce more natural vitamin D and they have less autoimmune diseases. So again, this is a correlation, not a cause, but there have been a lot of studies looking at vitamin D supplementation. And vitamin D plays a very significant role in also helping to regulate the immune system. So people that have a vitamin D deficiency are going to have a higher risk of developing an autoimmune disease. Many autoimmune diseases will follow a relapsing, remitting kind of pattern where sometimes you have symptoms and then it will calm down and then they'll come back and then it will calm down. Not all of them, like type 1 diabetes, it doesn't come and go. You always need to have insulin, but different ones like multiple sclerosis, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's and, you know, lupus and those kinds of things, they, they tend to have triggers. So they're not causes, but it's something that stimulates a relapse. And some of the most common factors that will do this are going to be stress because stress produces that hormone cortisol and in different levels, cortisol and other inflammatory cytokines can increase the reactivity of the immune system, making it more likely to attack those self tissues. So stress plays a really significant role. Also vitamin D levels and diet in general, eating very inflammatory foods can trigger the immune system to be overreactive. So anything like any kind of chronic inflammatory condition, like for example, heart disease is a chronic inflammatory disease. So when we have constant stimulation of the immune system, like for example, an omega-3, omega-6 imbalance, right? Omega-6 increases the inflammatory response, and sometimes we need that. And then omega-3 will decrease the immune or the inflammatory response. So the immune system has to be in balance. And when we start shifting towards too much inflammatory molecules in our body, then that's going to potentially trigger uh, either an an autoimmune disease to begin or for a relapse to occur. So with autoimmune diseases, the last thing that I want to touch on is treatments because they all generally work by the immune system overreacting or targeting self tissues, then the most common treatment is immunosuppressants. And something like psoriasis might use a topical um, corticosteroid that you can put on the skin. Sometimes it will be ingested like prednisone and anti-inflammatory kinds of molecules like NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that help to calm the immune system down. And then sometimes pain medication. Different ones might require different things like sometimes surgery might be required for the bowel inflammatory diseases or the thyroid. And then sometimes something like light therapy, you know, for psoriasis, even just exposure to UV light. If you have it on your knees, most common places are elbows and knees and face for psoriasis. Sit in the sun a little bit and it actually makes a significant difference. So even though we don't know exactly what exacerbates autoimmune diseases, uh, or what triggers them. Um, and we don't know exactly what stimulates a remission either, but the factors that are very, very important are reducing inflammation and reducing stress. Those two play a very key role. And then with allergies, the immune system is reacting to harmless substances like dust or cat fur or peanuts. Um, so allergens can be taken into the body either by consuming it, if you eat food that you have an allergy to, we can inhale it like breathing uh, pollen in the springtime, or it can be injected, for example, either a medication or a bee sting or a bug bite. And then that antigen can go directly into the bloodstream. So how our body reacts to those antigens is a little bit different depending on the mode of entry into the body. So for example, allergens that we consume like food or have injected like a bee sting, they're going to cause the most severe allergic reactions compared to allergens that we inhale. When we are exposed to an allergen, we have B cells that are going to be able to recognize these. So B cells have antibodies, these little Y-shaped things are antibodies, on the surface of the cell, and when antigens bind to them, it triggers a cascade of reactions. Let's suppose this antigen is a peanut protein. 
and it binds to this B cell. This B cell happens to have an antigen that recognizes that peanut protein, and it never became tolerant. We can also have tolerance. Then that antigen is going to stimulate the B cells to become plasma cells, and plasma cells will then secrete lots of antibodies. Now, it's important to note that the specific type of antibody is going to be an IgE, or immunoglobulin E. Now, those antibodies can go and bind to a mast cell. So remember from our previous videos that mast cells are found in connective tissues and they're all throughout the body. They're not only in lymph nodes or the spleen. And they produce a lot of histamine. Histamine is that main allergic molecule that's going to have a few different key effects. Histamine causes blood vessels to dilate, so vasodilation, and this allows fluid and immune cells to move out of the capillaries to go into the tissue where there's the irritant or the antigen. Okay, remember your immune system is attacking it as if it was a pathogen. And then, Histamine also causes redness and runny eyes and itching and runny nose and sneezing and all of those kinds of symptoms. Histamine can also cause bronchoconstriction. So it can make the smooth muscles around the bronchial tubes constrict. And bronchoconstriction can become very severe and then you're gonna have wheezing and shortness of breath and difficulty getting enough air. And that is an anaphylactic reaction. So the main molecule that's involved in this whole process is histamine. Now, that is all that happens from the first exposure. First time you eat peanuts, you're going to stimulate the B cells. They will make antibodies and they will bind to mast cells. Now, this over here is your second exposure you may not have any symptoms at all from the first time that you're stung by a bee or that you eat peanuts. Now the next time you're exposed to that allergen, the allergen can directly bind to the mast cell that now contains these IgE antibodies. So now the next time that you're exposed, the reaction will be very, very rapid and the mast cell will secrete a lot of histamine and then the histamine is what causes the symptoms. So with an anaphylactic reaction, because it's so severe, there can be other symptoms as well, like nausea and vomiting. Um, usually blood pressure drops and heart rate goes up. So then what do you do when you have an anaphylactic reaction? So the most rapid treatment for an anaphylactic reaction is going to be an EpiPen, which contains epinephrine. Epinephrine is our neurotransmitter or hormone released by the adrenal glands, normally during a stress response. It causes the bronchial tubes to dilate so that air can start moving more freely. So the most common food allergies are eggs, fish and shellfish, peanuts and tree nuts. There are lots of other allergies and a sensitivity. The last thing I just want to point out, sometimes people have food sensitivities or a food intolerance. That is not the same as an allergy. So when you have an allergy to a food molecule, you're producing IgE antibodies. Sometimes you can have those skin tests. That is just looking for mast cell histamine production. So when you get poked with different antigens on your skin and you see the swelling, that is histamine production. So that's showing that there's an allergic reaction. A sensitivity, you can still have a type of immune response that increases inflammation, but it wouldn't cause an anaphylactic reaction. So autoimmune diseases target yourself proteins and allergies target harmless substances. So here's a summary chart of our autoimmune diseases that we looked at.